All right. Um, there was a little bit of a sync issue with OneDrive this, this morning because I created an announcement slide, but for some reason it decided not to populate. But long story short, you all have a homework due today. I'm going to take this homework, get it out of your way, and set it up here on this chair. If um, you have not turned that in, do me a favor and do so like now because it's due. Um, today, what we're going to be doing is talking about LTB, about lateral torsional buckling. Now, I told you all on Friday, I said, brace yourself because we're going to have some diffy cues in here today. I wasn't kidding because we're going to have some diffy cues in here. So, um, so just be ready for that. Uh, let's see. I guess that's all I got. Okay. Um, let me just sort of jump right into it. Um, starting here, I got a couple things I kind of want to put on the board first because there are some analogies that you're going to see here in a second, and I want you to be aware of them. Okay, first off, all right, move this out of the way. Okay, last time we talked about torsion, just torsion in general. And we had derived last time uh, an equation for circular cross-sections. And we said that the equation, the differential equation for circular cross-sections is some applied moment equals gj times phi prime. And so when I say phi prime, I mean, you know, the derivative. Okay, that's for a circular cross section. So that's a, a pipe, a, a, a solid circular shaft, uh, anything like that. Now, if you're dealing with a non circular, that's not good enough. Okay, it's not good enough, and I'll show you why here in a second. Now, let me spoil this and tell you what the differential equation is, okay? And there's nothing that's really on here that isn't in the slide, so I, I'm not like, you know, uh, uh, you know no, nothing mysterious here, but I just, I, I feel, it, feel it's kind of necessary to sort of go through this independently. Okay, so for a non-circular cross-section, the differential equation is as follows. We have this part, but we have a new component it's tacked onto the side, and it's this minus ECW times, and it's the, the triple derivative, okay? And there's a reason why it's, it's the triple derivative, and you'll see why, um, or the third derivative, I guess I should say. Okay, so each of these parts corresponds to a particular phenomenon uh, that goes on mechanically uh, with a generic shape. Now, this first one is called pure torsion or sometimes it's called St. Venant torsion. This one right here captures the effect of warping. Now, I'm going to pass this around because I think this is valuable, and if you need to stand up out of your seat to see it, go ahead, don't be shy. I want to show you something. Uh, let me go ahead and slide. Okay, so this right here, this first part, this is this, uh, this GJ phi prime, this is what you all did in Engineering 216. You have a shaft, you twist it, what's the angle of twist? TL over GJ, that, that's all this is. It's just rewritten in terms of derivatives. It's nothing that you haven't seen before. All right? But the warping effect, that's new. When you did Engineering 216, you limited your discussion to circular cross-sections, solid shafts, pipes, things like that. The reason why is because a circular cross-section does not warp, okay? What do I mean by warp? I have here an I-beam. I'm going to hold it down on the table. And I'm going to pass this around. If you want to stand up and do this, go ahead. I'm going to hold this down, and I'm going to twist this. Give it a super twist. And if you look, what you will see is not only did it twist, but you'll see if you look, you can actually see the flange go in and out of the plane. Like you can actually see it. You can actually see, 
you know, one flange sort of go like this and the other flange go like that. It goes in and out of the axis, okay? That effect where it goes in and out of the cross section, that's called warping, okay? Circular cross sections don't do that. There's a reason why if you look at, you know, transmissions and cars or rack and pinions or axles or anything in machines that are being twisted, there's a reason why they're circular. It's because circular sections, A, are pretty efficient in withstanding torsion, and B, circular cross sections don't do that. If I have a circular shaft connected in this fashion and I twist it, I don't have to worry about my hands getting butted up by some, you know, piece poking out at me, okay? The problem is we're not talking about circular shafts, we're talking about I-beams, so we have to be able to handle the warping, okay? So I'm going to pass that, if you, again, stand up, don't be shy, all right? Now before I start going into differential equation land, I want to take you back to structural analysis, and I want to tackle that sort of relationship, that derivative relationship, because we're going to see it pop up uh, again real quick. So, first off, consider uh, deformation. So, deformation could be something like y of x, which is deflection. It could be what we're talking about here, phi of x, which is angle of twist. what have you. I, it doesn't really matter because you're, you're going to see where I'm going with this here in a second. Okay. Let's, let's just consider deflection because I think that'll be like a little more familiar with, with what you saw from structural analysis. So the y of x, that's the deflection. Well, if I take the derivative of that deflection, I get either the slope or the rotation, right? I get that phi of x, or that, that theta of x. Y'all remember that? It's like if I have a beam, there's a question of how much it deflects and how much it rotates. Remember that? And then what I can do is I could take the second derivative and get the curvature, but we really didn't mess with curvature that much directly. What we did mess with was taking curvature and multiplying it by EI. What is curvature times EI? Does anybody have another name for that? Here's, here's another way of looking at it. The curvature is something over EI. Anybody remember what that is? The second derivative of deflection is blank over EI. There we go. It's the moment. Remember this? Remember that? Second derivative of deflection is M over EI. I know you've seen it before. I know. So this could be an expression for our moment. Okay, so let's see if you all can follow this one. What if I take the third derivative? What do you think that's going to be? If this is the moment, take the derivative one more time, what am I going to get? No, no, no. The, the, ignore everything in this class. Go back to 312. The shear. Remember the relationship between a shear diagram and a moment diagram? You took the derivative of a moment diagram, you got the shear diagram, right? So this is the shear. And if I take the derivative one more time, what's that going to uh, yield? The load. Exactly right. Bam. So what I want to prep you for is that when we're going through this, there's going to be essentially a fourth order differential equation. Okay. A fourth order differential equation that, that goes from deflections all the way back down to loads. And so that's the relationship between loads and deformations. It's really fourth order because you go like from loads to shears, 
shears to moments, then adjust to get into curvature land, then curvature to slope, slope to deflection. Okay? Everybody all right with that? Yes. And great question. And, and this basically is it. It's our fundamental differential equation for beam deflection. That the second derivative of deflection is M over EI. We derived that last semester. And, and, what, and so we used this to, all, we used this differential equation to ultimately, we never solved it. Instead, what we did is, let's see if you all can see this. Instead, what we did was this. We didn't solve it, but instead we, we developed a, a sort of a generic way of approaching it through virtual work. Y'all with me so far? Is, it, is, is Math 335 starting to seem like, a, like at least a, a halfway useful class? Don't worry. Don't worry. I really, I really don't get too much into Math 335 land. There is a point I will show you when we hit Math 335 land, and the way that I handle it is really, really easy to follow, so don't worry. Okay. Now, one of the things that if you all are twisting this thing and taking a look at it, did you notice how the warping is primarily occurring in the flanges? Like, the web is sort of staying where it's at, and really it's the flanges that are going in and out of the plane. Did you all see that? I, I hope you did. I hope you saw that as it's going on. You can kind of see it here, that the flange is remaining fixed, or the, the, the web is remaining fixed, and it's the flanges that are going in and out. So when we look at warping, so I'm going to, this, so these next few slides are going to be how I get here, how I derive that, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to see if we can focus on those flanges in order to develop an expression for warping. So the way that I do that is I say, okay, here's my section, the section rotates, and there's some internal shear force inside that flange that I'm trying to determine. Now shear, shear should relate to what? The third derivative, right? So I'm going to keep that in mind. So if this angle twists, and this dimension is h over 2, I'm going to propose that that displacement, how far that flange goes over, is that angle times h over 2. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this expression and I'm going to take the third derivative. So I'm going to differentiate once, differentiate twice, differentiate three times. So this is a constant, so it just gets pulled out. And so here's what I'm left with. Why am I differentiating three times? Because that third derivative is related to shear. So what I do is I'll say, all right, if that third derivative is related to shear, and again, I'm not expecting that you follow every single step. And, you have to take every single little plus and minus sign and follow it. I'm not expecting that you do that. I just want you to kind of get the general idea of what I'm doing. So if you say, all right, here's the third derivative. Well, the third derivative is equal to V over EI because, you know, this is the shear is, you know, this is V, this is M, this is, you know, some value, uh, you know, some load. So I can set those two equal to one another, and I can come up with an expression for what's the shear in the flange. Now, the reason for the negative sign is because technically, from uh, beam deflection theory, there's a negative right there. We never really considered that in structural analysis because we always assumed downward deflections were positive. So we just really didn't affect what we did last semester. But, the, but technically, there is a negative there. OK. So there's the uh, shear force in the flange. and so. Warping generally comes from a shear deformation because what's going on is the flange is kind of doing that. It's kind of deforming in shear, hence why we need that term. And the way that we get the warping moment this way is we just, it's just a force couple. It's just a force times the distance. So shear times the height, plug and chug, you know, do a little bit of algebra, and we get minus E times this pile of junk here, this IFH squared over 2. This term, IFH squared over 2, is a section property. It's just the moment of inertia of the flange times the height of the section. It's just geometry. You know, it's like a moment of inertia or a section modulus or a radius of gyration. 
I, I mentioned it again, radius of gyration. Oh my goodness. There's a name for this, this, uh, this section property and we call it a warping constant. Now, just so you are aware, and I know this is going to seem really weird, all right, moments of inertia are in what, inches to the fourth? Warping constants are in inches to the sixth, and they're really big. If you open up your manual and just pull the, you know, the W30 by 90 or what have you and look at the warping constants, they're big. They're really big. Okay? And if you want sort of a numerical comparison, compare it against the J value. Like just pick any W shape in the manual and you'll find that the J value is really tiny and the warping constant's really big. Like what are you looking at? What shape? A 33 by 169, what's the J value? 17.7, and what's the warping constant? 82,400. I sections resist torsion primarily through warping, which is just, just sort of how it is. So this is sort of how I'm getting this, this differential equation here. So a general differential equation for torsion is the pure torsion uh, 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 component added with the warping component. And the negative just comes from the direction of the shear. And we, we use that shear component. Where's my beam? Thank you. We use that shear component because when you twist the flange, you know how the flange goes in and out? So it's sort of like, here's what your flange was before, and then afterwards it kind of does that. So it's almost like the flange itself was sheared. That's why we're using that shear component. Okay. Are there any questions about that? This is good stuff. I want to make sure this is, this is relevant. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to start deriving lateral torsional buckling. In other words, if I take this section and I bend it, okay, so here's the section and I bend it, how much moment until it does that? So I'm bending and it, whoo, it sort of kicks over and twists. That's lateral torsional buckling, okay? So in order to do that, I'm going to apply some bending moment at the end. So I'm putting the section under constant moment. And that's going to be kind of important here in a second. But I'm putting it under constant moment. And I'm going to have three different components of that that I'm going to need to consider. So again, you don't have to worry about following every single little minutial step. I just want to make sure that you're following the general idea. So there's a couple of differential equations that you need to consider. First off, here's this one. Now let me show you my coordinate system here. So I'm going to erase this because there's a lot. There, this slide's pretty busy. I understand that, so I want to make sure that you're clear as to what's going on. So here's the section. So there's your, there's your eye shape. Okay? And so the way that my coordinate system is working out, this is the z-axis, the x-axis is lateral, and then the y-axis is going down. So, like, it, remember if you have x, y, and z, your displacements go, like, displacements here are u, or I, sh I shouldn't put it like that, I should say u, u, v, and w, okay? Yes? Oh, that is a wonderful question. The answer is, yes, it is for this problem. And no, you don't do that in the real world. That is a wonderful question. So this, different, this solution that I'm going to do, I'm going to have to adjust it. Okay? And I'll give you a spoiler alert as to how we do that. But we're going to derive a critical buckling stress. Okay? And it's going to be a, a, a bunch of stuff. Okay? But when you look what's in the spec, what's in the spec is C sub B times that bunch of stuff. What is that? It's accounting for the fact that the moment changes. That's what C sub B is. So you folks in concrete design, remember how C, I said C sub B was way different in here? This is what I was talking about. So, Great question. 
So far so good? Okay, so the first differential equation I want to show you is just this one. This is just the second derivative of deflection is M over EI. That's just regular old uh, Euler-Bernoulli beam deflection theory. That's just what we did last semester. So second derivative of deflection is M over EI. That I don't really care about. What I really care about um, is 2 and 3. So this second derivative uh, or this second differential equation is trying to basically relate the amount of moment that we apply this way to how much the beam deflects this way. So I'm trying to figure out how it deflects like along the x-axis. And so the way that I'm doing that is I'm saying, well, I'm just taking that moment and multiplying it by the sine. Okay, so it's just a trig problem. It's just sine and cosine. However, this part right here, this sine of phi just sort of equals phi. Like, how, like you're just making stuff up now at this point, Dr. Mike. Like, how can you just set the sine of phi equal to phi? Like, what gives you the right? Who do you think you are? Well, let me show you. Here's, here's who I think I am. What's this graph look like? It starts at zero. What's it do? It does that, right? And what does... That's the two curves equal to one another, right? So if the angles are small, those two curves pr hug each other pretty closely, right? It's like a Taylor series or something. They were like, oh, don't mention Taylor series. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use small angle theory to replace this sign with just a, the, the phi value. Everybody with me? My third differential equation is what I just derived, this GJ phi minus ECW times the third derivative. Again, why the third derivative? Because your flange is primarily in shear. Okay, so here's essentially what I do. I use some vectors to relate how much moment I'm applying this way to how much moment I get along the axis. I'm not going to go into to, to vector math with you, but take those two diffy Qs. Again, I, you can follow the, the math if you want. I'm not trying to make it super complicated. Take those two diffy Qs, set them equal to one another. I get this. I take the derivative one more time. And the reason why I take the derivative one more time is because I can replace this term with that. And then I get this. So I know it seems like I just skipped over a lot, but what I just skipped over was setting equations equal to one another and algebra. I assume you all can do algebra. You've been, you've been getting through this entire semester with... with uh, and you've been doing algebra in here. Okay. So I know what looks, what's in that box seems pretty nasty, but here, what's, oh my, not quite, not quite. And, and I'll, I'll get to that here in a second. What's in that box looks kind of nasty, but here's another way of looking at it. It's some constant times a fourth derivative minus another constant times the second derivative plus some other constant times the function equals zero. Now, this is where math 335 comes into play. Okay? For those of you who, who have taken differential equations or are in it now, that is a fourth order linear ODE. Okay? And the reason why we're saying, let's, let's for you, if you haven't had differential equations, let's break down the terminology. It's fourth order because the largest derivative is a fourth order derivative. See, largest derivative is a fourth order derivative. Okay. It's linear because all of the uh, coefficients are constants, right? GJ is a constant. ECW is a constant. This is a constant, because I'm assuming that the moment is constant. And it's an ODE because there's no partial derivatives in it. All right? Everybody with me? Now, that's where the math 335 essentially stops. Okay? I'm not going to make you solve a differential equation. 
We engineers try and avoid that more often than not. We try and avoid solving differential equations. Now, here's the thing. I can handle this differential equation one of two ways. I can you know, do the characteristic equation, r to the fourth, r squared, and r, and try and come up with the roots, and try and write some expression that's ridiculous. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to try an easy way. Okay? An easy way is to guess a solution that's easy to differentiate and that meets the boundary conditions. What do I mean by the boundary conditions? Here's the beam. And so this is L. And so what we're trying to do is come up with some function that represents the angle of twist. Actually, that's the Z. Some function that represents the angle of twist that meets our boundary conditions. What are our boundary conditions? Well, what's going on right here? Zero, zero. Now, what's also true at pin supports? We know that the deflection is zero. What else do we know about the pin supports? Maybe the moment equals zero? Would you agree with that? The moment has to equal zero at a pin support. Well, I would say the moment relates to what? The second derivative? So we need to come up with a function that's zero at the ends and that second derivative is zero at the ends. That's what we need. So here's what I'm going to guess. I'm going to look at this and say, man, that looks a lot like a trig function. Kind of looks like a sine function. So I'm going to say, let's take the sine of some angle. Now that's not good enough, though, because if I plug in phi equals L, the sine of L isn't zero. But the sine of pi over L times that is zero. What happens if I plug in zero for this? What do I get? If I plug in, if this value is zero, what is that? What's the sign of zero? Zero. Oh, you all know that. What if I plug in L here? What do I get? The L's cancel, I got the sign of pi. What's the sign of pi? Come on, what is the sine of pi? I know you all know that. What is the sine of pi? There, zero, there we go. My goodness. The only thing I gotta add to this is some constant, and all that constant is is what's my maximum deflection. So this is the value that I'm assuming for, this is basically what I'm doing, what I'm doing is I'm assuming an answer. Now you all are looking at this like it's crazy. It's really not. Remember I said that the function has to be zero at the supports and its second derivative has to be zero. Let's, let's continue this out. We have the sine. What's the derivative of the sine? Cosine. What's the derivative of that? What's the derivative of that? What's the derivative of that? See how it repeats? We have sine, cosine, negative sine, cosine. goes back to sine. Our equation has a function, a second derivative, and a fourth derivative. All of those are functions of the sine. We can substitute, pull the signs out, cancel, solve for the moment. So it makes life a lot easier. No more calculus. The calculus goes away. This is the last part of calculus. All this is is just me taking the derivatives and throwing that old chain rule in there to make sure that everybody follows the, uh, the constants coming out. Remember, how's the chain rule work? Like, how do you go from here to here? You take the derivative of the outside, but then you've got to multiply it by the derivative of the inside. Remember that? Man, 
I told you we were gonna have some calculus. You're looking at me like, yeah, but we didn't think you meant calculus. <laughs> All right. So all I'm doing here, this is all I'm doing. Taking that solution, plugging it in, pulling everything out that's constant or that's that's common, set the guts of that equal to zero, solve for m. Do some algebra. There you go. I haven't written the final yet. So am I. Oh, we'll just wait. Okay. Now, this is what you get from actually deriving the, the moment. So this is the moment that causes LTB. In other words, if you take that beam and you bend it, this is how you would compute the lateral torsional buckling capacity. The equation in the manual is a little different, like it's, re, it's rewritten a little differently. And the only reason for that is just formatting. So for instance, all they did is they took this and divided it by the section modulus to get a stress. And then they took this and they rewrote it a bit. Now they didn't rewrite it to be uh, a jerk. They actually rewrote it to be quite nice to you. What we just derived is the expression for a doubly symmetric beam. In other words, where the top flange and the bottom flange are exactly the same. But if those flange sizes change, then the differential equation changes and the solution changes. Well, instead of making you as an engineer jump through a bunch of different hoops with all these different expressions, what they did is they took this expression and they rewrote it a bit so that this looks a lot like the term for a singly symmetric section. So what's in the spec, like going from here to here is just defining a couple different terms to make your life a little easier for if you have to do something more complicated. Again, it's, it's not trying to make it complicated, it's trying to make it simple. All right, is everybody with me? I promise the differential equations are over. The calculus is over. Even the hefty algebra is over. You made it. I believed in you. You got through it. Okay. I got one other thing to show you and then we're going to call it. Ms. Wedge had a question. She said, is this only true for uniform bending? Yeah. Well, how do we handle it when it's non-uniform? Here's the expression in the spec. Or here, here's the expression we derive, here's the expression in the spec. Now first off, this term C, that's always going to be 1 for I shapes, so you don't have to worry about that. But this term right here, whew, that term is, that term t takes some thinking. What is that C sub B value? That C sub B value changes this differential equation, uh, what makes, it, makes the solution that we derive very doable. This right here is a fourth order linear differential equation. The reason why it's linear and the reason why the solution that we proposed works is because we took the moment to be a constant. We just treated it like we did any other constant in a DPQ. Well, moment isn't constant. Here, here's an example. This is a constant moment. Take a beam and twist it. Draw the moment diagram, it'll look like that. But when have we ever saw that in practical situations? Never. We usually see stuff like this. So how do you use this solution for real life cases? The answer is that, C sub B. C sub B is a moment gradient modifier. Here's the thing. This fourth order Diffie Q, if it became a nonlinear Diffie Q, it'd start to get kind of tough. You'd have to start breaking out some you know, numerical means to solve a Diffie Q every time you wanted to do a beam design. And I get the feeling y'all don't want to do that. Like if you thought this was tough, a nonlinear Diffie Q is really tough. Okay? So C sub B is an empirical factor that helps us handle non-uniform bending. So this is uniform bending. This is an example of non-uniform bending. And fortunately, C sub B, really easy to compute. All right? C sub B is computed using the following expression. And don't worry, I'm going to recap this part uh, on Friday. So 
There, just so you're aware, there have been all sorts of different expressions for C sub B over the years. And I will mention, this is particular, particularly true for you senior design folks, the C sub B that's in the bridge spec is different than the C sub B that's in the building spec. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. Um, and like you can open up the spec and read the eight pages of commentary if you'd like. Um, that's sort of outside the scope of this class, but I would say that the two primary reasons are bridge girders have usually much different geometries, and on bridges the loads have a, a much larger tendency to want to move. So that changes moment gradient if the loads move. Um, this is the expression for C sub B, um, the, and I will show you the way that it works when we come back, but I do want to clarify something. C sub B is a moment gradient modifier, but it is a moment gradient modifier inside an unbraced length. So for example, if we're looking at this particular problem, there is a different C sub B value between each bracing element, okay? And so you, if you want a generic explanation for what C sub B is, it's kind of a measure of how steep your moment diagram is. If you had a moment diagram that looked like this, C sub B would be one. Whereas if it starts changing up a bit, like if you had, let's say, a brace in the middle, you'd have a pretty high C sub B from here to here and a pretty high C sub B from here to here. I will go through the specifics of how to compute C sub B on Friday. Wednesday, I'm not going to be here, so we don't have class. That's all I have. See you on Friday. <laughs>